Last time we had a quick chat about the importance of having a decent first aid kit in your shop and how that can potentially save your life in the event of an accident. Today we're having a chat about how not to get brutally maimed in the first place. Welcome back to the second part in this series all about workshop safety in a small workshop, especially if you're working on your own. I had some amazing comments in the last video. Thank you to everyone who commented, um, especially there was a couple of people commented on the fact that a tourniquet should only be used as an absolute last resort, which is 100% correct. Arterial blood loss, you know, you've got a matter of minutes, I don't know before you kind of run out of blood. The thing that you need to keep in your head is that you need to get help as quickly as possible. So yeah, tourniquet, last resort, but it could absolutely save your life. The biggest thing that will get you in a workshop is complacency. I cannot emphasize it enough. When you're doing a repetitive task over and over and over again, your mind starts to wander and you lose focus on that task. It's nothing to do with how professional you are. It's nothing to do with how many qualifications you've got. It's nothing to do with how good your tools are. It's because your mind will drift off and you will become complacent. And that's when things will go horribly, horribly wrong. Keep your focus on what you're doing at all times. That doesn't necessarily mean, you know, don't listen music, don't listen podcasts, you know, all of that can kind of help a bit to keep your mind alert while you're working and it can stop your brain getting so bored that it drifts off. So I have no problem working with music and podcasts on, but my point is don't be complacent. Don't assume it's not going to happen to you. I'm going to run you through some of the basic stuff that I do to keep myself safe in the workshop. I'm going to give you one or two tips that will hopefully stop you from getting seriously injured in the first place. What I'm then going to do in separate videos is a little bit more detail about each tool. So I'm going to quickly take you through everything from head to toe of kind of what I wear in a workshop that will hopefully kind of stop us getting injured in the first place. This isn't the best gear in the world. This is just what I view as kind of middle of the road, stroke bare minimum of what you need to keep yourself safe. So, first of all, if you have evolved to the degree that you no longer require hair, one of the main reasons that I almost always wear a hat is because when you don't have hair on your head anymore, when you don't have hair on your head anymore, you know about it when you crack your head off something. And that's why I've almost always got a hat on in the workshop and it's freezing. But one of the main reasons is because I have many scars on my head from the days where I wasn't in the habit of wearing a hat. I've even got a hard hat cap that I sometimes wear if I'm like working in tight spaces like under floors and stuff like that. Again, just to kind of protect my head a bit. All the usual stuff for your face, eyes. There is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Norm Abram is 100% correct. I've done a video about safety glasses before. I'm not gonna go on about them. Respirator or dust mask, depending on the sort of work you're doing. There's a million different types of these. I'm not gonna go into that in any detail in this video. Again, this is kind of a middle of the road one with interchangeable filters. It's not amazing, but it does the job. I don't often wear these because once you've got a hat and goggles and a respirator on, sometimes it's hard to get hearing protection on as well. And generally, I like to be able to hear what the tool's doing. So hearing protection's a bit of a last resort for me because you can identify a lot of faults with a tool by being able to hear it properly. If you want to wear hearing protection all the time, fill your boots, that's absolutely fine. I don't. I tend to only wear hearing protection for really noisy stuff. Like if I'm doing a lot of stuff with a router, that tends to be like a very high pitched noise. I've already got tinnitus from playing the drums, so I don't want it to get any worse. Full face mask. Again, you know, these come in varying different qualities. This is a cheap one. 
because I very rarely do anything that requires a full face mask. But if you're ever doing like really risky lathe work where stuff is likely to kind of fly off into your face, another thing is like anything to do with grinding metal. With these glasses are quite good because it's got the foam lining around it, but often when you're grinding or cutting metal, the little shards of metal can get under your glasses. So sometimes it's a good idea to have that on as well. You know, this is all you need to work out for yourself for the sort of work you do. I'm not telling you what you should buy or what you should wear. I'm just saying what I do for the sort of work that I do. I'm not the most health and safety conscious person in the world. It's just after you've had a few accidents, you kind of think to yourself, well, if I don't do that again, then I'll not nearly die. If you've got long hair, please tie it back, put it in a bun, put it in your cap or hat, tucked away. Hair getting trapped in machines is probably one of the most dangerous things like ever because it'll just wrap itself around even things like a pillar drill. It'll wrap itself around the drill. When it happens you'll panic. You'll not even know at that point where the off switch is because you'll be panicking and your head will be getting dragged closer and closer to the drill or band saw. Table saw maybe. Table saw is more likely to just rip the hair straight out your scalp. But anything where it's got a slightly slower motion to it, as I say, pillar drill, band saw, I mean, gen just everything. Please tie your hair back, get it out the road, tuck it down the back of your t-shirt, what, whatever. Get your hair out the road so your face doesn't get sucked towards the giant spinning blade. Working down. I'm wearing a jacket at the minute because it's Baltic, but you'll see all, excuse me, but you'll see almost always when I'm wearing a jacket it's got elasticated sleeves on it. You don't want anything with loose sleeves. Again, you know, just wear if you're operating a table saw, stuff like that. Preferably try to be in short sleeves. I'm only wearing my jacket because it's winter and it's cold, but I prefer to work short sleeved if at all possible. And then it just gets that risk out the road. You know, sometimes depending on what I'm doing, I'll even just roll my sleeves up and then get on with what I'm doing and then roll them back down when I'm finished. A classic for that is the jointer with the big sucky in blade on the top, which if anything gets caught in that, it'll just pull you straight into the machine. Horrific. So general rule of thumb across the board, no loose clothing, unless you're Colin Furs working down. These have, believe it or not, saved me a couple of times because We've got multiple layers of pockets at the front here and that extra kind of thickness of fabric around this area genuinely can help in a lot of situations. I'll cover that on table saw video. Try and use proper work pants. You can't, obviously, you, if it's the middle of summer and you're going to be working in shorts or, or whatever, you need to weigh up how much risk versus just getting on with your life. Knees. I wear work pants with knee pads built into them. The worst ever work-related accident I've had has been the manly titled housemaid's knee. And I had to have an operation on my knee. So there's a scar down there. And my knee was out of action for probably about four months that I couldn't kneel at all. If you are reliant on kneeling in your job, imagine what it'll be like if you can't kneel for four months. And that's why I wear work pants with knee pads built into them. They're just, uh, I could probably do with some new ones. Uh, they're not too bad, but uh, they're just basically bits of foam that can be cut to size and they fit down into this pocket on the front here. And then I never ever have to think about knee pads. My knee pads are always there. And then finally, down to the boots. I do have proper kind of steel toe cap boots. You know, unless you're working on a building site. I've never really seen what all the fuss is about with, with steel toe cap boots. They're handy if you want to like kick things. But other than that, nothing has ever dropped on my toe to a degree that it makes any difference whether or not I've got steel toe cap boots on. That's up to you.
I wear them mainly because they're comfortable and if I didn't have anything on my feet it would be weird. A couple of folk also rightly asked about what I do about fire safety in the workshop. Again, as with everything, you can always do more, but what I generally always have, I've got two bottles of water permanently on my bench just in case my bench bursts into flames. I've also got a fire extinguisher in the corner of the room and outside the workshop I keep a couple of big things of water as well. I have no idea how that would help me in terms of a fire related incident. So my biggest tip for keeping yourself safe in a small workshop, and this is what always tries to go through my mind when I'm working on any potentially dangerous tool. I see people all the time, they're kitted up to the nines with all the health and safety equipment in the world, but it's not gonna save them in the event of this thing happening. And it applies to any tool in the workshop. The number one thing that goes through my mind when I'm using any tool, I'm not thinking about where everything else is while things are going right. I'm trying to keep at the back of my mind where things will end up when things go wrong. So for example, and I'll cover this in a bit more detail in future videos about the different tools, but it applies to everything. Say for example, I'm pushing a bit of wood through the table saw and you know, I'm correctly using a push stick to push it through and I'm standing to one side of the blade, but let's say I decide for some stupid reason to lean on the table saw like that. And then let's say I get kickback and let's say that that kickback hits this hand and causes my hand to give way. And as a result, I fall face first onto the blade. Or let's say we're putting a bigger bit of wood through. Hold on. Let's say we're putting a bigger bit of wood through and I'm putting some force with this hand in that direction to keep it against the fence. And then something happens. I don't know, again, maybe kickback, that bit of wood isn't in its expected position anymore and it's gone. This hand's still putting force in that direction. And this hand, when this bit of wood isn't there, is gonna end up in the blade. Everything's great when you've got a great big bit of wood in the road between you and the very sharp rotating blade. What happens when that bit of wood disappears? This is why on things like jointers, you always have the blade guard over, and then when you're pushing the bit of wood through, you skip over where the blade is with your hand. Wherever possible, it's not always practical, but you try wherever possible not to be doing that and push, keep, keeping that, because your hand's pushing force down. It's pushing force that way and that way. If something goes wrong, say for example, this bit of wood catches on a knot and then it goes shooting backwards, your hand's gonna go straight down into that blade. And that's why we always try to skip the blade when you're pushing things through. Same applies with router tables. It's exactly the reason why on a router table, when you're pushing things through, you try and skip where the blade is. It's not because anything's gonna go wrong while you've got this great big bit of wood in the road. It's because when the bit of wood disappears because something has gone wrong, where's your hand gonna end up? Or where's your face gonna end up? That's why we do these little things. We're thinking about where are you gonna end up when things go wrong? Not where are you gonna end up while things are going right? Remember, as I said in the last video, pretty much every tool in a joiner's workshop is designed for cutting and shaping wood. And if it can cut and shape wood, it'll cut and shape you. And some of the most horrific accidents I've seen haven't been with the great big tools. It's been with the smaller tools like Stanley knives, uh, palm routers flying up into people's faces, grinders and belt sanders where clothing can get like sucked in and then you end up grinding your hand down. 
awful, awful things can happen if you don't operate an element of common sense. So if I had to summarize this video, because one of the dangerous things about health and safety is that often the bureaucrats who have no idea what's involved in doing a job will come out with endless like legislation and like massive documents that nobody reads and they make it all far too complicated. And that's a really dangerous thing because when you make it too complicated and you put too many rules and regs in place, then people follow none of the rules anymore because they don't know what they should be doing. So if I had to kind of simplify this down to four points that I try to keep at the back of my mind, whether it's in the workshop or outside on a customer site. Number one, make sure you've got a first aid kit to hand and it's stocked up with everything that you're likely to need in the event of an accident that is likely to happen to you. Secondly, make sure you're wearing all of the obvious kind of health and safety gear that applies to the job that you're doing. Whether it's a hat to keep your head safe or a high-vis jacket if you're working near like traffic and stuff like that, or knee pads if you do a lot of kneeling, eye protection, pretty much applies to almost everything. You need to work that out for yourself as to what is likely to go wrong in your type of job and how can you protect yourself in the event of something going wrong. Thirdly, think about where your body is going to end up when something does go wrong. Not if something goes wrong, when something goes wrong. Because if you do this, especially if you do this for a living, it's not a case of if, it's a case of when. Finally, my fourth and most important point, don't be complacent. Don't assume it's not going to happen to you. Because as soon as you lose focus and you start to get cocky and complacent with things, that's when things go wrong. And with some of these tools where you've got blades spinning at 20,000 RPM, the accident happens, the damage is done before you've even had a chance to think about what just happened. If you implement a bit of kind of common sense, you'll be absolutely fine. And you know, you can take it to the nth degree. I mean, I love skiing and I'm not particularly good at it, but I love doing it, but it carries enormous amounts of risk. You could wrap yourself up in bubble wrap and like just roll down a mountain. It wouldn't be particularly fun and it's not what life is about. Life is about taking a certain amount of risks, whether that's as a job or as a hobby. But if you just implement a reasonable amount of common sense, then you can minimize the risks and prepare yourself for what you do if things do go wrong. Pop in the comments below whether or not you're an amateur or a trained professional. What sort of accidents have you had that have wiped you out? And what sort of impact has it had on your job or on your life and everyone who thinks that trained professionals don't have accidents please read the comments below stay safe folks i shall see you next time